Welcome to our Ebenezer Spring Conference. It's a great privilege uh, to uh, come together and, and to really share good news about what God is doing with his people of Israel. And uh, I'm, my name is Johannes. I'm from Germany and I'm part of the international Ebenezer team. And I would like to welcome, of course, everybody from our uh, Ebenezer family, but especially I would like to welcome guests who may be the first time at an Ebenezer event or even the first time at a Christian conference where we speak about Israel and God's plans with Israel. So just for you to understand, uh, Ebenezer Operation Exodus is a group of Bible-believing Christians who serve God in supporting Jewish people on their way home to the land as promised in the Bible. And we started 30 years ago in 1991 during the Gulf War where we realized that God not only is uh, regathering his people from all the nations, but he wants uh, Bible believers to have a part in it. And God has allowed us to uh, help more than 180,000 Jewish people to return to the land since 1991. Uh, our uh, emphasis was from the beginning always on intercession and then the intercession had uh, uh, resulted also in the practical deeds. So our ministry has uh, still intercession very much on our heart when we help practically and we teach the church. Like today, the emphasis will be uh, for this day to really give out teaching because we see that many Christians do not know uh, God's plans about Israel. So uh, we want to, uh, but first acknowledge that without God, we could do nothing. The Almighty One, the creator of heaven and earth. That is why I would like to start with a prayer uh, before we have a welcoming word from uh, our dear uh, chairman of the International Board, uh, Pete Stucken from Australia. I would like to start with a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege to come together in your name around the globe today and to uh, exalt you and to thank you for all the wonderful things you are doing and that you are faithful to your promises. And Lord, we ask now that you give us open hearts and even a deeper understanding of who you are and what your plans are and how you want to use your church to bless Israel in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, Pete, I would like to welcome you uh, to share with us uh, a few words. Dear friends and family, shalom and greetings. Welcome to our 2021 Spring Online Conference. No, we can't be together in Jerusalem or in some other part of the world. We have to be online at the moment, but that's fine. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere wondering why it's a spring conference, just remember that in Jerusalem, it's springtime. And Jerusalem sets the days, the times and the seasons as ordained by the Lord. So welcome. I want to share with you a word that's come to me just last week. There's a precious couple here in the Far East who've been supporting and praying for a long time. And when they send a gift, they often send a scripture with the gift. And this time... The scripture that came was the last verse of Isaiah chapter 40, one that you all know well. They that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. And I reflected on this and I thought, actually, this is a word for, for the whole ministry at this time. Because we have gone through a challenging season. We still are in a difficult season. On the one hand, we just thank the Lord for the resourcefulness that he's given us to press on when circumstances are so different. The Aliyah has not stopped. It's continued, albeit under greatly increased obstructions, hurdles, and difficulties, but it has continued, and to him be the glory. And amongst all of that, there's been pressures on all of us in terms of not being able to have the freedom of movement that we've normally enjoyed. We miss being with each other, even if we can share 
in prayer and fellowship online. It's not quite the same. And for some, there's been even a sense of the pressing down of all these circumstances, of perhaps being in lockdown or facing shortages, facing difficulty, uh, bereavement even. And there's been a sense of this has not been an easy year. And it still isn't easy. We don't expect it to be easy. But in the midst of this, we bring this, we receive this word that the prophet Isaiah brings and remembering that he brings it first to Israel. We don't take it for ourselves ahead of recognizing that this was a word given to Jacob, to the sons of Jacob. And I'll just read the last few verses of Isaiah chapter 40. Haven't you known, haven't you heard, I'm reading actually from the complete Jewish Bible, which I've been particularly enjoying using this year. Haven't you known, haven't you heard, that the everlasting God, Adonai, the creator of the ends of the earth, he doesn't grow tired or weary. His understanding cannot be fathomed. He invigorates the exhausted. He gives strength to the powerless. Young men may grow tired and weary. Even the fittest may stumble and fall. But those who hope in Adonai will renew their strength. Those who hope in Adonai, we also know it as those who wait on him. Those who hope in him will renew their strength. They will soar aloft as with eagle's wings. When they are running, they won't grow weary. And when they're walking, they won't get tired. So let's thank the Lord for this word that he's sent to us as Ebenezer family at this time. He is the one who refreshes us in a time of weariness. He is the one who gives us strength. He's the one who empowers us to serve in the way that he's called us to do. And we think of ourselves as those called to this amazing work of helping the Jewish people home. The words that come to my mind also are from Paul in 1 Corinthians, where he says, the Lord uses the weak to shame the strong, the simple to shame the wise. It's not about our own resources, our own endurance, our own strength. In fact, he is our strength. Let's receive his refreshment at this time. I'll turn that up, that scripture. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. God's weakness is stronger than humanity's strength. Just look at ourselves, brothers and sisters. Look at those whom God has called. Not many of us are wise by the world's standards. Not many of us wield power or can boast of noble birth. But God chose what the world considers nonsense in order to shame the wise. God chose what the world considers weak in order to shame the strong. And God chose that on which the world looks down as common or regards as nothing in order to bring to nothing what the world considers important so that no one should boast before God. And that's what it's about, isn't it? As we understand this principle that yes, our God is one who strengthens the weak, but he also chooses the weak to do his work. And those who are not highly regarded in, in the world's eyes to do the precious work that he has in store to shame the strong. He, he uses us, you and I, and not many of us are Olympic athletes, some maybe are, but not many of us. He uses us to carry out his divine purpose in regathering his precious sons and daughters of Jacob back into the land. So at this time, as we gather online, let's receive his refreshment. Let's receive his renewing, his strengthening. Father, we do, we recognize we are not something that the world looks up to. 
Ebenezer is not an organization, a group of people that the world has high regard of. But you have chosen us, you've appointed us, you've called us. And you are our strength and our song. You're our salvation. And at times of weariness, when we feel maybe tired, we feel we need refreshment, we feel we need something new from you, it comes. You give us that refreshment. You release to us the power, the might, the anointing to fulfill what you've called us to do. And it's not about us, it's about you. None of us are going to boast about ourselves or our achievements. God forbid, but our boast is in the Lord our God. Yeshua, we give you thanks, we give you praise for preparing us, refreshing us and calling us to your work in these days. Amen. with the anointing of the Holy Spirit being amongst us to equip, inspire, and encourage us and strengthen us. If you're feeling weary, receive his strengthening today. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pete, for sharing with us. And it's really great uh, to, to work with you and... Uh, to, to be part of this uh, family and uh, thank you very much. But now I would like uh, uh, you all to, I, I would like to take you all with me to Russia, it's this wonderful country. You know, uh, some people say listen too much to the news, to the regular news, but I want to tell you there are uh, increasing good news from Russia. Why? Because there's a growing understanding of Christian believers in Russia, uh, why it is so uh, important to bless Israel and to support Jewish people, to stand with Jewish people. We see that the church in Russia has a, a dynamic where they really see God, how they can set a sign that they stand with Israel. And that is a wonderful testimony. And uh, our team in Russia, under the leadership of Boris Vasyukov, has sent us this encouraging video of a special prayer event. They had now the second time of, the, of a prayer marathon where literally tens of thousands of believers come together in one day in different locations and praying and blessing Israel. So let's have a look what God is doing in Russia. Shalom. Today we will talk about the signs of the time of the second coming of the Lord. The prophet Malachi said that before the Messiah returned to the earth, the hearts of fathers and their children must be turned to each other. Otherwise, the earth will be struck with a curse. From God's point of view, of course, we Christians, the church, are the spiritual children of the Jewish people, Israel, who have received covenants, vows, and blessings. Through the blood of Jesus, we have become coheres of the promises of the New Testament God made with the Jewish people and became as one. But over the past 2,000 years, a bloody history started by the substitution theology and ending in the Holocaust seemed to have turned the hearts of fathers and children away from each other forever. And if we do not want uh, the land on which we live to be cursed, we need to start doing something to change the attitude of the church towards the Jews and the Jews towards Christianity. Ten years ago, 
a Jewish-Christian dialogue began in Russia, a dialogue not of words, but actions. When Jews and Christians decided to jointly restore the memory of the Holocaust victims, and built monuments at the sites of mass killing of Jews during the war. When we began to do it, we saw how, we, how the hearts of the Jews and Christianity slowly began to move towards each other. And we saw that the topic of the Holocaust is understandable and interesting for the Church. At the beginning, there were few of us, but gradually, the dialogue between Jews and Christians spread beyond Moscow and began spread throughout the country, becoming a powerful movement within the Evangelical Church of Russia. Now it is supported by many tens of thousands of Christians. The culmination of this movement was the annual All Russia Prayer Marathons of the Jewish Christian dialogue. Once in a year, on January 27th, the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, many hundreds of Protestant communities in Russia, from Kamchatka to Kaliningrad, hold special meetings dedicated to the memory of the Holocaust victims and the restoration of Israel. At these gatherings, Christians share their grief with the Jewish people and collect special donations for the dialogue project. There is a live broadcast of these meetings on the internet, which lasts for more than 20 hours. Let me show you a video about the marathon which took place on January 27th this year. In this common house on Klemashkin Street in Moscow on January 27, perhaps the most large-scale event of Evangelical Russia took place. It's the second all Russia prayer marathon dedicated to the International Holocaust Remembrance Day and the restoration of Israel. Prayer for Israel has united more than 370 evangelical communities of different denominations, from the Commander Island to Kaliningrad, as well as believers in the Baltic countries and Ukraine. On January 24, services were held in churches with a total number of participants of more than 10,000 people. And on January 27, the videos were combined into a single 11-hour marathon, which was joined by more than 5,000 spectators. It is crucial because by doing such things, we are actually narrowing the old gap that existed between Jews and Christians on the one hand. On the other hand, we really do share the grief that Jews have for so many people who died during the Second World War. Therefore, our participation in the marathon certainly means a lot. I was particularly impressed of the scale of the marathon today. So many churches, so many pastors, so many bishops participated in prayer. And this is great because together we must remember, together we must bless Israel and say never again. Today is just a great honor to bless these people, to pray for these people. You know, the entire Southern Federal District, the North Caucasus District and many Caucasian churches may not fully realize or understand it all, but they continue to pray and joy in prayer. So today, we are together with you today. We love Israel. We bless Israel. Overall, we support the hands of God's people today. A very special event of the marathon was the award ceremony of the Russian Jewish Congress Remembrance Keeper. This year, one of its laureates is the coordinator of the working group of the Jewish Christian Dialogue in Russia, Boris Vesikov. The Remembrance Keeper Award is given to outstanding people who have made a special contribution to persevering the memory of those who suffered from the genocide. Uh, on behalf of Yulia Popov, received the award. Dear brothers and sisters, the title of the Remembrance Keeper awarded to me fully today belongs to each of you. So I perceive the award not only as a result of my personal merits, but also as a banner that we, together with all of us present in this hall, will raise today over a great ship called the Jewish Christian Dialogue in Russia. We remember, we are together. 
Мы вместе. Здравствуйте. Hello, dear friends. My name is Alexander Bensui. I'm the Israeli ambassador to Russia. This is a very good opportunity to congratulate all the participants of the second uh, All-Russian Marathon of Evangelical Communities in Russia. First of all, I would like to thank you for your activities in favor of the State of Israel, in favor of the memory of the history of the Jewish people on the territory of Russia. And I would say that I'm sure and I know that we have a very good cooperation with all evangelical organizations. And I'm sure that we will do the second marathon and many of our further events together. The marathon takes on the international scale. This year it was joined by the World of Life Church from Barcelona. The Rev Lane ceremony was shown at Yad Vashem. The third marathon promises to be even more ambitious, and we believe that soon it will cover all 24 time zones of our planet. And of course, it's worth mentioning the whole team that has worked selflessly for several months. It was a wonderful time. I can say for myself that I'm impressed by what is happening, how much the attitude of many Christians to people of God, to the firstborn or that God has chosen, has changed today. On behalf of the working group of the Jewish Christian Dialogue, I would like to thank everyone who participated in this great service in this marathon, especially the bishops who did the central main prayer of this marathon today. We will remember and we will keep the memory together and go to the next marathon. May God bless everyone. Christian Information Portal, The Call of Zion. Information Christian Portal, Zofsiona. Jesus is coming. What the prophet Malachi foretold is being fulfilled. The hearts of fathers and children begin to turn to each other. This is happening in our country. If this has not happened in your country yet, you can join our annual prayer marathons. Together we can make them international. Join us. We are together. So thank you very much, Boris and Kirill and the whole team in uh, Russia. Uh, just for you to know, Russia is still the country where most Olim, uh, Olim as uh, the Jewish people return to Israel, uh, are making their alias a way home to Israel. So our teams there have helped thousands, even since one year when the whole crisis with travel restrictions started. They are helping daily uh, so many Jewish people to, to return. And I would like to speak a prayer uh, blessings, the teams there. Father in heaven, we thank you and we glorify you for uh, the opportunity you have given now even to share your word in Russia in such a way. But Lord, we thank you also for the teams, for each one who are uh, visiting Jewish families. Lord, from uh, the, the west of Russia until Siberia and, and until the far east, Lord, to villages and in the big cities. Lord, we thank you for our drivers and helpers. Lord, for our faithful teams. And we want to bless them today and we want to ask ask you that you may strengthen them and use them and multiply their work in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, now I would like uh, very much to invite Willem Glasauer to share with us. He's uh, Reverend Willem Glasauer is a real dear friend of us and uh, I have not known many people who have done such a profound theological work about the topic uh, Israel and the church, really giving understanding of uh, God's plans with Israel. And we are so blessed uh, not only to have a friendship with Willem, but also with the whole team of Christians for Israel in the Netherlands. Uh, they are really one of the greatest supporters for the international Aliyah work, and it is a privilege to be partnering with them. So uh, let's take our Bibles and let's have an open heart now uh, to receive the word of God. Uh, Willem, uh, welcome to our conference today. To meet again together, although it's not in person, 
but through the electronic highways. I remember the times that we met several times in Jerusalem and in other Ebenezer conferences in England, in Estonia, and so forth. It's good that we meet again, and it's a privilege to be among you and have this great cooperation between us, Christians for Israel International, and you, Ebenezer International. All in order that his name will be praised, in order that his true church will be built, and in order that Israel will be comforted. The theme of today is the signs of the times. Uh, when you look at the daily news or you read your newspaper, many events are happening in the world. Uh, Jesus says, look at these events as signs of the times. He takes as an example the weather forecast. You can read it in Matthew 16. When evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times you hear that he's a little bit disappointed. He says, you're pretty clever in predicting the weather. Maybe not in all the details, but because of the weather balloons, because of the computer models, uh, they can present us with a weather forecast, not just for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, but for the week to come, even for the 14 days that are ahead of us. Again, not with all the details, but in general, we pretty well are able to predict what kind of weather is coming towards planet Earth. Now, Jesus says, when you look at the events in the world, the news in your television, in your newspaper, cannot you do the same? Maybe not in all the details, but cannot you predict, understand, what kind of weather is coming towards planet Earth. One day, the disciples are sitting on the Mount of Olives, looking over the city of Jerusalem. And then you read in Matthew 24 that as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives together with his disciples, the disciples came to him privately without the multitudes he often spoke uh, in front of many people, but in this case, it's just a private meeting, a private conversation with the disciples. The disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Right before this, they had, pointed to the beautiful city of Jerusalem, to the beautiful building of the temple. They were totally excited. Jerusalem had just welcomed Jesus to their city and they had shouted and they had taken the branches of the trees and put their uh, robes on, on the roads where he was traveling, shouting, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the great son of David, the king of Israel, peace on earth. They fully expected the kingdom of peace and righteousness to come to planet earth. What kind of kingdom did they expect? Well, you can read it in many passages in the Old Testament. Uh, but very beautiful is the passage in Isaiah 2, verse 2 to 4. There the prophet prophesies in the last days, in the far future, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. So in the far future, Isaiah says, the mountain of the Lord's temple, which is the Temple Mount, which is Mount Zion, 
or Mount Moriah, as it's called in the Bible, will be elevated. It will be raised above the hills. Uh, today, it's not the highest mountain. When you sit on Mount of Olives and you look over the city and the, the Temple Square, even the Mount of Olives is higher than Mount Zion. But in that future, that mountain will be raised up above the hills and all nations, Gentiles, uh, heathen nations, will stream to it. How will that happen? Not sure. Uh, but to lift up a mountain so that it becomes higher, apparently geological activities must take place. And Jerusalem is in an area where there are earthquakes. There have been earthquakes in the past and there will be earthquakes in the future. And then a mountain can be lifted up, other parts sink down, and the end result will be that the mountain of the temple will be the highest in the whole area. Uh, the Bible even prophesies about a rift going through the Mount of Olives, split in two with a great valley running down towards the Dead Sea and other geological uh, changes that will take place in the area. Whatever will happen, it will be as the prophet says, he will be raised above the hills and all nations, nations of the world will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob. What is the house of the God of Jacob? That's the temple. That's the house of God, where he dwelt among his people. There will be, apparently, again, a temple in the heart of Jerusalem. And the mountains will be hearing the words of the Lord, and the nations will go to the mountain and to the house of the Lord because he, the God of Israel, will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his path. The law, Torah, will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will teach us Torah in the person of Messiah the Messiah of Israel, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who will be in full control over planet Earth, sitting on the throne of his father David in the heart of Jerusalem. And so the word of the Lord, the Torah, the law, uh, law, yes, it's okay, but Torah is more than law. Yes, it has some do's and don'ts, uh, but it's meant to be directions to life for the nations. God gave the Torah to Israel to teach them how they could live a society of peace and righteousness and with all kind of detailed in instructions how to do that and to become a society in which it's a pleasure to live. And he gave that all to Israel in order that Israel would share it and show it like a priesthood to the nations of the world. God has chosen Israel to be an instrument of salvation for the world. And then the nations will hear this word of the Lord, will hear uh, the Torah from Jerusalem. And not only that they are instructed how to live as a society in peace and righteousness around the world, he will judge between the nations. He will settle disputes for many peoples. Today, when nations have a difference of opinion, they go to the United Nations in New York trying to find a solution for their conflict. And if they fail today, they often go to war. 
they wage war, and whoever wins the war apparently was right. Then no more. Then he will say, this is how we solve your conflict. He will judge between the nations. He will settle disputes for many people. And if that's the case, there's no reason to go to war anymore. Now, what will you do with your weapons, your rockets, your tanks, your bombs, and whatever you developed? Melt them down, turn them into agricultural tools. And that's exactly what they will do. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation. And the military academies can be closed because they will not even train for war anymore. That's the picture that the Jewish people taught by the prophets expect of the future of Israel and of the future of the world that finally there will be peace on planet Earth. Finally, from Jerusalem, this peace will flow among the nations. Peace and prosperity, righteousness, even some changes in nature so that the whole creation, as it were, comes to a rest, a rest of a Shabbat uh, of a thousand years is what the Apostle John says at the end of the book of Revelation. Uh, rabbis compare the history of the world with the history of creation. And they say the Bible says a day is like a thousand years. So when God created everything in six days, mankind history will contain six thousand years and they're close to the 6,000 today because they count the years from Adam, not from Christ as we do. So, but after the six days of toil, of suffering, of death, of destruction, of all kinds of terrible things, there will come a seventh day, the Shabbat of a thousand years, rest for planet Earth, the rest for mankind. And after the seventh day, there will be the eighth day, the renewal of all things, when eternity enters into creation itself with the new heavens and the new earth, and it will last forever and ever. Knowing that, the disciples sitting on the Mount of Olives, they're all excited. They are absolutely convinced that Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the great Son of man who is also the Son of God, and that he's now entering into the city to bring this peace for Israel, liberate Israel and Jerusalem from the oppressing forces in his days, the Roman Empire, and then judge the nations and bring this peace from Jerusalem, sitting as the king on the throne in Jerusalem over the whole world. They're absolutely convinced that this is going to happen. So they point towards uh, the beautiful city when you see the sun shining upon the Jerusalem stones. It's a city of gold. It's glowing almost. And so they say, look, Lord, the beautiful city. Look at the beautiful temple. The holy presence of God will dwell in the temple again. And you are the king. And finally, there will be the kingdom of peace and righteousness. Finally, war is over. And then Jesus says to them, do you see all of that? Not a stone will be left upon another. That must have come as a total shock for his, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's the king, he's the great son of David. Jerusalem destroyed, the temple destroyed. It will be the center of the kingdom for the whole world. Destroyed? But it actually happened 40 years later. When the Romans came and destroyed the city, destroyed the temple, 
murdered over a million Jews, dumped thousands of Jews on the slave markets of the Middle East, took thousands with them to Rome to show the emperor and the Roman people uh, their might and their power, how they had gained victory over Jerusalem and over the hated Jews. So 40 years later, what Jesus prophesied was fulfilled. The disciples, when they had swallowed this, that apparently this coming of Jesus to Jerusalem would not bring in the long expected kingdom of peace and righteousness, then they ask him that threefold question. When will this happen, this destruction? And as I said, it happened 40 years later. Second question, what will be the sign of your coming? And coming is parousia, coming in glory. How can we understand the signs, the things that are happening in the world, that you are coming again? They now understand that this first coming will not lead to this kingdom. It will lead to the cross. It will lead to solving the basic problem of mankind being sin, being sin between God and man. He's going to solve that problem by taking upon himself the sin of the world and the brokenness of creation, carrying it away so that everlasting life might enter into creation again. That first but they knew their Bibles. So they knew, if not now, that kingdom, when? How do we know? Because it will come one day. That's what the Word of God was teaching them, and they're absolutely right. How do we know that you're now coming again in glory to bring in this beautiful kingdom of peace and righteousness upon planet Earth. What is the sign of your coming? Help us. And of the end of the age. They're not asking about the end of the world. Uh, in some translations it says end of the world, but no, it's not about the end of the world. It's about the end of the age, of the Ion. Ion, the Greek word meaning a part of world history, a period of time through which mankind and planet Earth is going through. And so they said, when will this terrible part of world history finally be over? And when will the next part of world history begin? When will you come in glory and make an end to all the troubles on planet Earth and when will then the next stage of world history start of peace and righteousness on planet Earth? And then Jesus says, now you sit down and I'll explain. And then what follows in uh, Matthew 24, and you can also read it in Mark 13 and in Luke 17 and Luke 19 and Luke 21, Jesus sums up a whole lot of signs that will help us to understand that his coming is quite near, quite close now. In Matthew 24, he speaks, as I said, about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. He speaks about false Christs and false messiahs, false saviors of the world, claiming that they are it. He speaks about wars and rumors of wars. He speaks about nations going against other nations, kingdoms against other kingdoms. He speaks about famines and earthquakes, about persecution. He speaks about being hated by all the nations. He speaks about people will turn away from the faith. He speaks about betrayal that even People will hand over, children hand over their parents and parents hand over their children. 
Again, false prophets. He speaks about lawlessness. It's when you look at what he says about the future, when we think about the signs of the times, we think of earthquakes and, and uh, wars and pestilences, uh, contagious diseases, and they're all part of it. He mentions them all, but three times he mentions the false prophets, the false Christ, the false saviors of the world who will come and claim that they will be the ones who will lead mankind and planet Earth towards a kingdom of peace and righteousness in the name of man, not in the name of God, but in the name of man. He says, and they will have many, many followers, multitudes will come back to that. He speaks about lawlessness, people not respecting the laws of God anymore, but being themselves to laws. And if that happens, then the love will grow cold. Uh, the laws of God are a blessing for mankind. If the nations of the world and if societies like ours would respect and act according to the laws of God, we would almost be halfway to paradise already. Even if we would not believe in the God who gave the laws, we would experience the blessings and the benefits of the laws he gave. And if we don't, lawlessness sets in, and then there will be no more restriction the Romans said, basically, homo homini lupus est. The man is a wolf to other men. He's continuously looking around him how he can use others for his benefit. He will devour another person if that is in his interest. Um, but the law gives room, protects people, against one another so that peace will be the result. But if the laws are shoved aside, the love grows cold. He talks about an abomination that causes desolation in the holy place. It's not quite clear what he mentioned there. Uh, the abomination that causes desolation in the holy place. Some say, well, he's referring to an end time temple in which Antichrist will sit showing himself to be divine, like God, um, in that temple. Um, but other possibilities are there as well. Uh, he doesn't use the word naos, which is a perfect Greek word for temple, he says there will be standing something on the holy place. And that will cause desolation. Um, the holy place can be the place on which the temple was built. Mount Zion, in the heart of Jerusalem. There will be standing something on the holy place that will cause desolation and ultimately a lot of turmoil. Uh, what is standing on the holy place today? There are two mosques. And a third mosque is being cut out within the mountain. It's not a place where the holy name of God is worshipped, but there's another God being worshipped, Allah. And when you study Quran, you see how uh, there are beautiful verses about peace in the Quran, but there are also very strong verses against Jews and against Christians, against unbelievers from whatever kind. So from that holy place, sometimes there's also a message coming of death and destruction, of hatred towards Israel and also hatred against the Christians. So what's the meaning? There will be 
standing something on the holy place that will be a source of destruction, of hatred, and of a uh, lot of tribulation. And in the end, it will be so big that Jesus even says, flee uh, uh, from that area. So the signs of the times that are coming before his coming, they're not pleasant. There are a lot of problems. But a beautiful verse is verse 8 uh, that he says, all these are the beginning of birth pains. All these catastrophes, all these crises that will come over our planet, he says, don't you worry, they're birth pains. Yes, they're very unpleasant. And when you have children uh, and you watch the process, hey, your wife giving birth, it starts slowly. She says, I feel something, some contraction of the muscles. Could it be a birth pain, birth pain? And a couple of hours later, she said, but this was one. And then it sets in and it becomes stronger and stronger and the time intervals become shorter and shorter and shorter. And in the end, when the body tries to drive out the baby, it can be so strong and so painful that your wife can say, I can not take anymore. Will this be all right? And praise God, most of the times it is all right. We have four children. I've seen it happen and tried to hold the hand of my wife and pray to God that he would lead us to this glorious moment that a new baby would be born. And when that's happening and you hold that miracle in your arms, then the pain is soon forgotten. So Jesus says, what is coming over planet Earth, all these signs of the times, their birth pains, they bring forth the new baby, the new life, the kingdom of God on Earth. So understanding the signs of the times uh, is understanding that the closer we are getting there, the stronger the crisis will become, the shorter the time intervals. And in the end, you think planet Earth cannot take anymore. This is the end of the world. No, he says, this is not the end of the world. This is leading towards my coming in glory and towards my kingdom of peace and righteousness that will flow forth from Jerusalem into the world. Now, among all these signs of the times, most of them, as we heard, are pretty negative and we need a lot of faith and courage and strength to, to keep on going, uh, expecting his coming in glory. But there are two pos positive signs. The two positive signs, he says, the gospel of the kingdom the good news about that beautiful kingdom of peace and righteousness will go as a testimony around the world. It will be heard by all the nations in the world. Uh, when I was somewhat younger, I thought, well, how is that possible? It will take a long time before the last missionary will reach some tribe here or there in a corner of the world. So I will not experience this. I'll be long gone before uh, the final nation on earth has heard the gospel of the kingdom until our eldest daughter went to the mission field in Central Asia. And then she one day said, Father, I come to villages um, and then I find sometimes some Christians there. And then I asked them, who was the missionary here? Uh, and sometimes they said, there was no missionary. 
but we listen to the radio. And in our language, they told us about Jesus. And it changed our life completely. And so suddenly you start to realize it's happening today, hundreds of hours every day through satellites, through the internet, through the social media, uh, through whatever electronic highways, means of communication we developed, hundreds of hours every day in practically all the languages of the world. The nations today can tap into this good news about the gospel of the kingdom. It will reach them and it is reaching them today. So Jesus says, when you see that the gospel of the kingdom is going through the world and people and nations can connect to it, tap into it, then you must understand that the end of this part of world history is almost there. It could happen any moment that Jesus is coming in glory. And the second positive sign that he mentions is about the fig tree. It's a picture of Israel, of the Jewish people. He says, when the fig tree comes back to life, it seems to be totally dead. And for 2000 years, the Jewish people seem to be of no importance whatsoever anymore. They were spread around the world uh, in their Roman captivity, kicked out of their land. Although in Israel, during all these years, always a small remnant of Jews have been living in that area, but unimportant. Other powers, world powers took dominion over that area over there in the Middle East. Jews spread around the world, uh, hated around the world, persecuted around the world, also in the lands of Christianity. The big massacres of the Jewish people in the last 2000 years took place in the lands of Christianity. Yes, in the lands of Islam, sometimes there happened things too, terrible things, but the systematic eradication of the Jews in the Middle Ages and ultimately in the Holocaust took place in Christian Europe. And the church often, there were good exceptions, praise God, my parents have been hiding Jews in the war as well. But in general, Christianity was silent and simply watched what was done to these hated Jews who got what they deserved because they did not accept Jesus as their savior and Lord. That was the teaching in the church for many years. The church said, we are the new Israel. God is finished with the Jews. He spread them around the world as a punishment. No, he did not. He spread them around the world as a blessing. He put them among the nations of the world with their synagogues, with the holy books, in order that they would be a blessing for the nations. And instead of we watching them and taking example in the lifestyle they had, we hated them, we ridiculed them, we despised them, we beaten them, and ultimately we killed them. So, the tree, the fig tree seemed to be totally dead. Without any hope, without any future, living among the nations of the world. But Jesus says, one day the fig tree will come back to life. You will see that these seemingly dead branches, new green leaves will sprout out of it. It comes back to life. The nation will come back to the land of Israel. 
it will be a vibrant nation, it will be uh, a restoration in the promised land and a restoration all in preparation of the coming of their Messiah, of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to bring in that beautiful kingdom. So we see the restoration of Israel, the restoration of the land, the restoration of the city of Jerusalem, the restoration of the Jewish people to the land. One day we will see the spiritual restoration of Israel as well. And it's all because the time is coming quickly now that the savior of the world will come to take his rightful place in the heart of Jerusalem on the throne of his father, David. Jesus says in these signs of the times, discourses that we find in the gospels in the New Testament, uh, that when you see the fig tree, Israel, coming back to life, you must understand and realize that the kingdom of God is right at hand. It is before the door. So these two positive signs point towards the imminent return of Jesus. The preaching of the gospel of the kingdom to the nations is coming to an end, slowly but steadily. Yes, every day, hundreds of hours, but it will be followed by the end of this age and the restoration of Israel will be close to the coming of the kingdom around the globe. So there's actually nothing, uh, not much anyway, uh, that still has to happen in the world before Jesus can come. All these negative signs, the birth pains are happening, and also the two positive signs are happening, pointing towards uh, the coming of the Lord. Now, I've said already a few words about the false messiahs, the false Christs, the false prophets. Uh, three times among all these signs, Jesus mentions them. He, apparently thinks that's very important. And in the rest uh, of the Bible, you find more details about these false Christs and about these false prophets. And ultimately, it will lead to one person, the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness, the beast that will come to the world stage accompanied by the false prophets. There are many false prophets in the times that are behind us in the history. There are many greater and smaller antichrist, types of antichrist like Hitler and, and, uh, and other of these dictators who caused rivers of blood to flee in their rule uh, as tyrants over their nation, over their lands, but ultimately there will be the one, the Antichrist, in the end of days. Now sometimes people say, how do you know that we are living in the last days? Uh, didn't they say the same thing in the year thousands and in the year 1500s and even before that, that it is the last day? How do you know that today we're living in the last days. When did the clock of the last day start to tick? Well, you can read it in Hebrews 1. For instance, the beginning of the book of Hebrews. There you read, in the past, Hebrews 1 verse 1, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son or in his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made even the universe. 
So the last days, these last days, are the days in which this creator, this word of God became flesh and was born as a baby in Bethlehem, in Israel. That's his final word that he spoke. And it happens in the last days. The prophet spoke in the centuries before, but in the last days, he has given his final word, so to speak, into this world. Jesus was born. From that moment on, the clock of the end times start to tick. Uh, also, Peter uh, refers to something that happened in the book of Acts, using the same word on the day of Pentecost, that uh, when the Holy Spirit is poured out upon, uh, upon 120 uh, of Jewish people who were coming together, there were a million people at the feasts uh, in Jerusalem sometimes. Uh, this is the feast of Shavuot, the feast that we call Pentecost. And then not on the one million Jews, but on about 120 of them, because that's the figure that you read in Acts 1, the Holy Spirit is poured out. And then Peter refers to one of the prophets and he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit. In the last days, in the last days, Jesus was born. In the last days, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Now in uh, the epistles that the Apostle John wrote, he's not speaking about just the last days. He's also speaking about the last hour. You can read it in 1 John 2, verse 18. There he says, dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. He says in the end of the last days, in the last hour, there will be the Antichrist. Yes, there have been many Antichrists, even in the days that John wrote these words, but it will ultimately lead to the coming of the Antichrist. It is the man, he says in verse 22, who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Such a man is the Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Israel, because sometimes you hear people say, well, can the Antichrist not be a Jew? No, he cannot, because Israel never denied the Father. There's a mystery that many of them don't understand who Jesus is, but they're not without God, and they acknowledge him as their father. You are our father, Israel says. So they, this is someone who denies the father and denies the son. Um, and he will show himself almost uh, to be divine. You can read that in 2 Peter. Whereas John calls him Antichrist, and never forget the word Antichrist has two parts. Two small words put together, Antichrist. Anti in the Greek meaning instead of, and the second meaning against. So the Antichrist is a Christ, a Prince of Peace, instead of the true Christ. He's a false Messiah. He's a Messiah. Christ and Messiah means the same, anointed one. One is Greek, the other one is Hebrew. But Antichrist means a Christ, a Messiah, instead of the true Christ, instead of the true Messiah. And the second meaning of anti is against. So he comes to the scene as a prince of peace with a beautiful, like a genius having a book and an ideology speaking proud words, as you read in Revelation 13, 
presenting the solving of the world problems, telling the nations, I will lead you to peace and prosperity around the world. I will solve the problems of war and peace. I will solve uh, the economic crisis. I will solve uh, the pollution problems. And he is so impressive. And there is this false prophet, his minister of propaganda on his side, who sell his ideas through the media, through the television sets all over the world, that the nations will say, this is brilliant, we need that. And then in the United Nations, they will say, could you please be the world president? Because this is what we all need, not our own social and other national problems, but this should be implied on an international level. And we cannot have people who say no to these solutions because that will block this great future for all of us. So we will give you also the power to implement these beautiful ideas. And so he's coming to be the world president at the request of the nations. And everybody's happy and everyone will cheer him. Um, in 2 Peter 2, this Antichrist is called the man of lawlessness. Um, excuse me, that is 2 Thessalonians 2. Where Paul explains uh, about this man. He says, you should not become easily unsettled or alarmed by all kinds of teachings or prophecies, reports or letters supposedly having come uh, from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come, the great day of vengeance of the Lord. Don't anyone let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself into God's temple proclaiming himself to be a God. I think what he means by temple well, it could mean a small temple in the heart of Jerusalem, but Paul, when he uses the word temple, he never refers to that building in Jerusalem. He says, you, your body is a temple. He says, you, church, you Christians together, you are the temple. You are the building, the house, the temple in which God lives. Now he says this antichrist, this man of lawlessness, will penetrate even into the Christian churches. He will bring a message that man himself is divine. Not you have to convert or you're beautiful as you are. I'm okay, you're okay. We're all in the depth of our minds and in our hearts. Uh, we're divine. So he sets himself even in the temple of God to bring this humanistic gospel uh, of the divinity of mankind itself, even the divinity of material matter, creation, universe, all like with a divine spark in it. He says he will even do that sets himself in the temple. He will show all kinds of miracles and wonders. He will have a political uh, system in place that the whole world will uh, be following. In the book of Revelation, you read in chapter 13 that out of the sea of nations, a beast comes. 
Eh, John calls him Antichrist. Paul calls him man of lawlessness. John again in the book of Revelation, a beast. On a world scale, a political system that one more time brings on a worldwide scale what some of these uh, kingdoms in the past uh, had one after another. When you read in the book of Daniel, Daniel 2, the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar sees, he also sees it um, as beasts following one after another. Uh, Babylonians, uh, Medes and Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, etc. All these empires had their own characteristics, uh, but they had one thing in common. They all hated the Jews. The Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. Medes and Persians had established a law that on a certain date, you can read it in the book of Esther, all the Jews in the empire should be murdered. And only because of the intervention uh, of Esther and Mordechai, it didn't happen. But they wanted to kill all the Jews. The Greek empire uh, hated the Jews, especially also the Jewish religion, especially circumcision of uh, the young eight days old boys, the baby boys, because they had a great admiration for the human body. You have all these nice statues in Greek art. Uh, and in the world of the Greeks, uh, the love between two men was of a higher order than the love between a man and a woman. So, and now to see these Jews cutting off uh, a piece of the foreskin of the male organ, that's barbaric. They performed their Olympic games in the nude because of the beauty of the, of the male body. And now to see it being mutilated, so they try to force the, the Jews into another religion, to leave their barbaric religion and serving the God of Israel and become this Greek Hellenistic, humanistic type of man. And they even uh, did it by violence, murdering uh, women, mothers who wanted to give their babies to be circumcised. In the end, everything that was Jewish was totally forbidden by them uh, with the, the penalty of death. And then Orthodox Jews took to, to their weapons and the Maccabees, you can read it in the books of the Maccabees. And lo and behold, they defeated this hatred enemy of the Greeks. So the Greek empire hated the Jews. And then the Romans, again, they were the ones who again destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and drove uh, the Jews out of their land. So all these empires, although they had different philosophies and different kind of uh, faith and different kind of practices. One thing they had in common, they hated the Jews. Now the beast in Revelation 13 brings all these characteristics one more time, a final time, on the stage on a world scale. And then after it seemed to be the ultimate triumph of what the devil started to lure man into uh, in paradise in the beginning of the Bible. Serve me and you will be like gods, he said. And now it seems that finally he becomes victorious all over m the planet and over mankind as a whole. Then, after very short-lived time, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will come and finish him off. Well, in this day and age, you and I are living today. We see how all these things are happening before our eyes, but we also see that 
the Lord is bringing this great sign of hope into the world, the restoration of the Jewish people to Israel. And we are called to take up our responsibility for that, that we are involved in Aliyah, that we help them to return from the four corners of the world back to the promised land. Because one day in the land, the final outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place. And then all Israel from top to bottom will see who Jesus really is. So let's be the resistance movement of the end times. Let's A great to a great to meet another man to re a great to meet again. A great to meet again together, although it's Okay, sorry, uh, all there were some internet problems, obviously, but I understand uh, we are at the end almost of Willem's message. And Willem, thank you very much. I think there are so many things uh, which are from, from importance for us to understand and to see. So uh, thank you, Willem. You have been a blessing for our ministry over many, many years, and I hope it will continue for many more years. Uh, I, I can imagine that there are some of you uh, watching, maybe thinking, how can I get more of this teaching? And uh, Willem, he has written a couple of books, uh, in English, also in the, uh, translated in some other languages. So you, it, it depends where you're watching. I don't know how you can get these books. You can uh, contact CVI in, in the Netherlands or one of our offices, and we can contact you and can maybe help you to find these books. But I would like uh, Willem uh, to, to help us a little bit to present, please, uh, some of your books and show us uh, how we can get a deeper understanding. Uh, so, Willem, please. For those of you who want to study further in the Bible about the things that we are speaking about, uh, there is this book, The Signs of the Times, 52 Signs of the Times, in 52 small chapters. Then there is the book, Until, with 14 uh, prophetic messages of Bible verses that contain the word until, which is a very prophetic word. Until means that it seems to be as never anything is changed. It goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on until, and then suddenly it radically changes. So that's really a book full of hope that one day it will change. I'm very glad to show you this. Behold, he comes. It's a daily devotional on the book of Revelation, verse by verse, day by day. And then in 365 days, you have gone through the whole book of Revelation. Don't rush it. Just take it a page a day. And then you grow into this wonderful message of comfort the book of Revelation, that Jesus Christ specifically came down in his glorious body to his old friend John on the Isle of Patmos to give the church comfort because he knows what difficult times lie ahead. The older books, some of you might have them, is what we call the trilogy, Why Israel? About the land and the people, the nation of Israel, after that came Why Jerusalem, 
part number two, because Jerusalem is a topic all by itself in the Bible. And thirdly, of the trilogy, why end times? Because Jerusalem and the Jewish people and the land of Israel, they're all parts of the great puzzle of the end times. And finally, today there is also Israel covenants and kingdom. How what the Bible teaches about the kingdom of God and what the Bible teaches about the covenants made with Israel, how they are linked and they fit like hand in love. Have good reading and study. May the Lord bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Willem. And uh, now, before we end this session, we would like to end with another great testimony of uh, the exciting times we are living in. You know, we have heard about bad things happening, and this we, we hear in the news every day, but we see also God is on the move. And some years ago, we had the great privilege to open, together with our Jewish friends, a center here in Germany, in Berlin, the Israel Program Center, where, which has developed into a place where many, many Jewish people uh, are getting prepared uh, to move to Israel, and especially young people. And uh, last year, uh, again, we, we, we have seen how uh, an increase of young people, uh, uh, increased number of young people really want to go to Israel. And here is a short clip of what is uh, happening in uh, Germany, but not only with Jews from Germany, even from all of Europe, from different parts. So thank you very much also to the international Ebenezer family uh, who supports this uh, project, which has developed in the last years uh, as a real, almost like a lighthouse uh, for many people. So uh, we switch to Berlin. Aber bitte jetzt eins nacheinander. Wonderful. Hi. If you have two rooms, please choose the room, the right room. Okay. Tov, ma shlomcha. Ebenezer is an international organization. We've been a non-profit organization for 30 years and we work in almost 60 countries, helping the Jewish people return to the Holy Land of Israel. The Nale Academy has been successfully operating in Israel for several years. Boys and girls aged 14 or 15 can apply to complete a high school diploma in Israel. Right now we're running the application and admission process. The Jewish people and the Jewish land and the Jewish Torah are one. So we wish you great success and please know that when you rise, when you go to Nale, when you make Aliyah, it's not only a physical change of your location, it is also a spiritual change. We always have to bring light wherever we go. Habe Hatzlacha and great success today in your seminar here. Thank you. Great. Good. The children are so excited about what's coming and I was moved to see that they really wanted to move to Israel. They didn't just hear about it or give it a try, they have a real desire to go and are working really hard to get there. This day is very long, there are several tests, the conversations require a lot of concentration and they're doing such a great job, I'm so proud of these kids. 
I am a teacher and currently a volunteer for Ebenezer. I'm helping with the Nale exams. There are intelligence tests, for example, here are three pictures, which one's the next, that sort of thing. Right now, they're doing general knowledge, English, maths, and a bit of Ivrit, so modern Hebrew. I find it fascinating to see that these kids really want to do this, and they come from all sorts of backgrounds. For example, last year, there were Turkish Jews. That's so interesting. Without the Jewish people, there would be no Christian church. The first church started in Jerusalem, as we know, not in Paris or New York. The apostles were Jewish men. We have the Bible, thanks to the Jewish people. At school, when I'm teaching religious education, I often start by talking about Abraham. I write down his name and also write down his name in Hebrew. And one child will always know how to write it in Arabic. And then that gives us a basis for discussion. Our God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And this connection has been challenged and questioned repeatedly over the centuries, but thankfully more and more Christians from all denominations are rediscovering this common root in our faith. Wir arbeiten so wunderbar zusammen. Es ist wirklich eine so eine zusammen, wunderbare Zusammenarbeit. Einer unterstützt den anderen. Und man ist diese Verlässlichkeit. Und das we work really well together. There is a strong cooperation between us. We support each other. We can rely on each other. We recommend Ibniza to Alia candidates because we know that they will support them and they're reliable. Because they'll often ask us, can we trust them? And we say, yes, of course. What fascinates me about this work is being able to work alongside people and helping them get to Israel step by step. It is very touching, especially now in this time, that can be quite challenging emotionally, being able to help people through that. One day, this older couple came in. They only lived around the corner here in Charlottenburg. They arrived in the old West Berlin about 40 years ago when the wall was still up. And they said, can you help us? We want to return to Israel. We want to die in the Holy Land and be buried there. So we helped them. We spent three weeks clearing out their flat, organizing the move. And by the time we took them to the airport, we had built such a deep relationship. In the evening, we got their texts and they'd arrived safely in Tel Aviv. Their daughter had picked them up. You never forget these kind of encounters. My daughter, Hannah, she's 15 and uh, she wants to move to Israel. And uh, we were quite unsure in the beginning to let uh, her go. Uh, but she was very persistent and this is what she wants to do. She wants to move to Israel. For the first um, several months, we just said no. And then uh, we started to talk to people and they said you have to let her choose her own path. And uh, now we're very, very happy with the choice that we let her. It would be um, a dream for us if it would actually work. We would love for her to live in Israel. The reason we were hesitant was uh, because your parents and you're used to your children being at home and you're in control and you can help them with everything. And she will be far away at the moment uh, unless we move one day. And that, that was the main issue to let go of the control. <laughs> But we are very happy now. I'm impressed that these young people bring so much character and willpower. You really see them become adults. So thank you very much, uh, Winfried and Judith and the whole team in Berlin uh, for the great work you're doing and uh, 
to really uh, show to the Jewish communities that there are uh, Christians who support them. And now if you feel encouraged today to become part of this worldwide uh, movement, I would uh, like to encourage you first to start to pray. I, I personally was in Israel 30 years ago in January 91 when Ibn Ezer was founded and started. And I know without prayer, uh, work is not possible. So start to pray. But then maybe the Holy Spirit may move you and, and you say, what can I do practically? And of course, uh, you know, teachers teaches us that money is a less important thing in the earth, but it shows where our heart is. You know, where your treasure is, is where your heart is. So you can start to invest into lives of people who want to move to Israel and to uh, rely on our support. And uh, for this conference, we decided not to give in a special project, which we did like two weeks ago for Pesach, but to really support our teams worldwide who are faithful. I, just to give you some numbers, before we had the corona crisis, we helped over 20 olim daily to come to Israel in an average. Last year it were less, but it still were over 14 every day, even with the whole crisis. So our teams, our drivers, uh, you know, who do the daily work, they need our support because very often they operate in countries where there's not enough support from this uh, country. So this uh, offering, which uh, we will pray for now, uh, you can give, of course, through your national Ebenezer office, or you can give directly through our PayPal account, which you can see on the screen, which is uh, giving at ebenezer-oe.org. Giving at ebenezer-oe.org. So I, I would like to pray now and praise that the God, the God moves many hearts, and that this offering will be also a sign of encouragement for our teams who work faithful, but also for the Jewish people who receive uh, help. You know, it may be for some we, we give money to pay uh, for a passport or for a birth document. And uh, of course, our, our uh, buses, you know, they need uh, uh, money to, to run, you know, to, to do the, the daily work. And our uh, people who visit the Jewish families very often in remote places. So uh, this afternoon you will see uh, more testimonies about the, in, in, from countries where we are operational. Uh, but now I would like uh, to pray uh, for this offering and for you. And that maybe God has started to speak to you. That you will find your way. When I was in Israel 30 years ago, I never thought that I will one time serve God full time within this ministry. But I must say, uh, it is a great privilege. And it doesn't matter if you don't have to be employed. It's a matter of the heart. You know, even when I was uh, pastoring a church, we prayed for Israel. We supported Israel. It's not like you need a, a, an, an employment contract. It starts between God and you. And just be open to receive God's calling. So, Father in heaven, we thank you again for this day today. And I ask you now for each one who is uh, watching this uh, message this morning, who is with us this morning, Lord, that you touch hearts, that you speak uh, also uh, how to get involved in prayer, in practical help, uh, being, become part of a team who helps the Jewish people in their nation practically or in administration and uh, in giving, Lord. Lord, I ask you uh, for this uh, offering now, Lord, that you will use it for your glory and that you will uh, speak to people even the exact amounts of what to give and, Lord, that we can really uh, declare you have not forgotten your people. And we thank you already for your provision and for your faithfulness that you uh, has, have given us this privilege to be part of your great work. And uh, I would like now, Lord, to, to, to ask that you may bless 
each one who is with us, each of the teams, each of the intercessors and the leaders and the people involved in the ministry. Lord, that your blessing is with the whole team and your encouragement in Jesus' name. Amen. So I hope to see you again. I mean, I cannot see you. You can see me uh, in uh, like four hours and uh, 16 minutes. Uh, more or less, we will be connected again and looking forward uh, then for the next session. May God bless you. Have a good rest. Uh, see you later. Goodbye. <laughs>